Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the class on uh, the Kingdom Builders, the Kingdom of God and Kingdom Builders. Uh, thank you, online students, for joining us. Also, welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this le uh, lecture later on. Uh, last week, we began a Chapter 4, Kingdom Thinking. We are on page number 35 uh, in, the, in the book, The Kingdom of God, so you can follow through. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can any one of you online students unmute your mic and lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Sister, can I? Yes, sure, Lucy. A loving Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for this opportunity, for enabling us to learn your word and empowering us with your word, which is all powerful and which is light unto our lives, O oh Master Lord. Thank you, O oh Father God. As we learn your word, let your be let your word be rooted in our lives so where we be a witness and a testimony to the society around us, O oh Father God. We thank you for your for the teacher you have blessed us in our lives, O oh Master Lord. We also submit our in-person students, online students, and e-learning students into your precious hands, O Master Lord, to be covered under the shadow of your wings when we learn your word to be, when we learn your word so that it will be in our minds and heart and to speak boldly and confidently in our lives, O Father God. Once again, we submit our lives into your precious hands, O Master Lord. Thank you, O God. In Jesus' mighty and holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lucy. So last week we began looking at uh, the kingdom thinking and how Jesus taught um, when he spoke, when he taught, he spoke a lot about kingdom thinking and he said, you know, this is how I want you to think in the kingdom of God. Okay. So even as we look at this chapter, the kingdom thinking, I want you to, uh, you know, I want to encourage each one of you to really develop a kingdom mindset a kingdom framework from which you will look at things, from which you would perceive things, from which you would make your decisions. And if we will do that, you know, we will truly be a kingdom community and we will have a kingdom culture among us. OK, so here are some things uh, that uh, Jesus taught about the kingdom um, and which will help us to think within the framework of kingdom thinking. We started this chapter um, uh, last week, so we will just look at what a few teachings that uh, Jesus taught. Uh, we look at from page number 36, okay? So here's the first thing Jesus said, you know, there's a higher standard of living in the kingdom. And we, last week we looked at and we studied Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 to 30, okay? And um, we learned that, you know, there's a much higher standard that you and I live by because we belong to the kingdom of God. Okay, And that is what we learned when we studied Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 30 um, last week. Now, we also see that Jesus taught about the power of love in Matthew chapter 4, verses 43 to 44. Okay, can somebody read that, please? Matthew 5, 43 to 44. Matthew 5. It's in your in the textbooks in okay. page number 38. Yeah. yeah. Matthew 5, 43 to 44. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who. Who persecute you know, 43 44 yeah 44 read please but i tell you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you okay but i say to you love but your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you okay so jesus is saying you know um this is what is the no, uh, uh, I mean, um, you know, this is how you need to live in the kingdom of God, or this is the kingdom mindset that you need to have. Now, in the kingdom of this world, the norm is you love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay. So Jesus is saying, listen, in the kingdom of this world, those who are lovable, we love them, and we hate those who are not 
lovable and those who are rude to us, uh, who are not good to us, we hate them. But he's saying in the kingdom that I'm coming from, which I want you to be a part of, which you are also a part of, you love everybody, even those who mistreat you, those who ill treat you, uh, you know, those who do wrong to you, you still love them, you still bless them, you still speak good over there lives okay now if uh if we would all do this our churches would be so different isn't it yes if we actually had this kingdom perspective of loving one another our churches would be so different if we actually were a kingdom community who lived the simple teachings what jesus taught us you know um, we would just have such a great kingdom culture we will have such a great kingdom mindset and a mentality that we would live by and that we would enjoy each other's fellowship and um, a relationship meaningful relationships with each other okay so he's saying you just do, uh, do good to those who are hate you and who despitefully use you Okay, so, you know, when you are in difficult situations, whether it's in the church, you know, your brother or sister, sister is sitting next to you who has done something wrong, you know, whether it's accidentally or knowingly, unknowingly, ignorantly, you know, uh, or in the, the same situation in your workplace, you know, or, or at home or in a gathering when you're gathering with relatives or friends and you feel, you know, somebody who has wronged you and, um, you know, they have hurt you and you want to react back. You know, you want to give them good. You don't want to speak to them. You don't want to even look at their faces. You don't even want to say anything nice or even hi, hello, how are you? Nothing. But, you know, uh, Jesus is saying because you belong to the kingdom of God, you belong to a different culture. Okay. So in this kingdom culture, it's not normal to retaliate. Okay. It's not uh, right or it's not the proper thing or it's not a done thing to repay evil for evil in this culture and in this culture it's very normal to love those who hate you to those who ill treat you and uh, you know to do good to them okay so in the kingdom of God the culture is love is the norm okay love is the standard and that is why you know uh, Paul writes he says love is Patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. That is the kind of love that we need to have. And if that's not the kind of love that we ca cannot have, it will not be written in the Bible. But we can have that kind of love when we have the love of God flowing in and through our hearts. Okay. So he's saying that God, Jesus is saying in the kingdom culture, in the kingdom thinking, this is a culture, you know, to love everyone, in, even those who do wrong to you or hurt you or, you know, uh, use you in the wrong way. Okay. Now, what about kingdom thinking when it comes to faith? Okay. Uh, we are on page number 38. Now, Jesus thought a lot about faith. And, uh, you know, it's uh, to walk in faith is a normal part of kingdom life. And to look at uh, things from the perspective of faith is very normal in the kingdom of God. So look at what Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. He says, have faith in God. Okay. In Mark chapter 11, verse 22, he says, have faith in God. God. So as a person who comes from the kingdom of God, we need to look at things from the eyes of faith. Okay. So you give up your right to fit God into your reasoning. Okay. You give up that right to fit God into our reasoning. Because the people of the world, what do they do? They reason out everything. Okay. And we, the people of this world want to put God in a box and we want to figure out everything. But in the kingdom of God, where faith is the norm, where faith is the standard, you know, we say that God is bigger than my reasoning. Amen. God is bigger than my reasoning. So we say that, you know, irrespective of what I reason, think, or my lo logical argument or my logical thinking is saying, I'm just going to believe, I'm just going to trust, I'm going to step out and I'm going to go with what God is telling me. 
Okay. So in your thinking, you begin to think like, yes, like, like kingdom thinking is like thinking uh, 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 with a faith perspective. Okay. And when you plan things, you plan with a, you plan with faith. Yes. You begin to plan with faith and you begin to see faith where, you know, we are beginning to see impossibilities becoming possible. Okay. That is what you do when you begin to see things to the eyes of faith. So for example, if God puts an assignment on your life and God calls you to do something that's way beyond that you ever thought or you would have ever imagined doing, and you know in the natural, in your own reasoning, you say, God, this is very impossible. This is too difficult. I don't think I'm cut out for this. I don't think I'm fit for it. But because you belong to the kingdom of God and faith is your way of thinking, you say, God, for me, in my thinking, it seems impossible. But I'm looking at it with the eyes of faith. And because I belong to the kingdom of God, I know all things are possible for him who believes. Amen. Okay. So look at what he says in um, Matthew chapter 6 verses 31 to 33 and Luke chapter 12 verse 31 and 32. Can somebody read that please? Therefore do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Luke Amen. 21, 31, 32. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So the Lord Jesus thought about faith in God, and he says our faith in God should affect every area of our lives, including the realm of daily needs. Even the little daily needs, we have to look at it with the eyes of faith. So he says when it comes to all these things, he taught us to have faith. Okay, Matthew chapter 6 verses 31 and 33. You know, when he says all of these things, it is your clothing, your food, whatever you need for your daily needs, and all these things he's teaching us to have faith in God. So we must come to a place where we know beyond doubt that it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And when it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom or when he's more than willing to give us the kingdom, how will he not along with giving us a kingdom give us everything that we need for our daily needs? Amen? Okay? So don't let your hearts be gripped with fear. Let fear arise from your hearts. So Jesus is teaching us to pursue the kingdom of God and not to worry about all of these daily things because when the Father is more than willing to give you the kingdom of God itself, when the Father is willing to give his only son to die on the cross for us, Romans chapter 8, he says when he gave his only son, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? Right? Will graciously give us all things which we need, not our greed. Okay, that is a difference. All the things that you need, he will give you. But the things that you're greedy about and it's going to spoil your life and it's going to ruin your life, he will not give it to you because he's a loving father. Okay, so when he's willing to give you the kingdom, he will also ensure or how will he not also ensure to give you all things that you need for life. So all of the things that are needed for your life is also granted in your life. Amen. Okay, so the next thing we'll do, we'll see about kingdom thinking is for the king's sake. Okay, you can look at your book so that you are not wandering away. And, you know, of course, some of the things which I'm saying is not here in the book, but you can still look and follow page number 39 for the king's sake. Okay, so how about doing or thinking things for the king's sake? In Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, uh, look at what Jesus says. You know, it's, Jesus has a very radical uh, invitation here. He's calling people and he's saying, you know, uh, do you want to come after me? And let's see what he says in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 35. Can somebody read that, please? When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take off his cross and follow me. 
for whoever desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it amen so jesus is saying hey listen if you want to come after me what should you do what should you do you should deny yourself and take up the cross and follow me because if you desire to save your life you're going to lose it but if you lose your life for the sake of the gospel you will save it save it okay so this is kingdom thinking okay so what is kingdom thinking is saying hey i'm following the king i'm going to deny myself i'm going to take up my cross and i'm going to follow him okay which means there will be times when you will have to lose your life for the sake of the gospel and what does that mean it means that you know uh, when you make your decisions when you make your choices or when you're you you're, you're living your life according to what god wants you to uh, how you what how he wants you to live or according to kingdom thinking you will you know do things which in the eyes of the world will look or be counted as foolishness but you're doing it for the sake of the gospel you're doing it for the sake of the kingdom okay uh, and you're willing to do it because you're doing it for the king's sake or for god's sake yes what does a uh, cross imply here like when you say deny yourself and take up the cross does cross imply suffering or does a cross imply god's way yeah to take it, up uh, the cross it, 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 it involves a persecution it involves suffering in the sense that when you are uh, when we're living in this world you know um, uh, there are people who are in job places in jobs where they need you know they are bribed you know or you have to compromise on your moral values your moral standards or you have to lie or you have to write the wrong figures or you have to cheat and uh, you know the crab mentality you pull you have to pull down somebody so that you can get up you know um, you know gossiping jealousy you know not giving people the due rights of what you know they are eligible to in whether it's promotion and all of those things and you are suffering because you're saying hey i'm not going to lie i'm not going to use the wrong numbers i'm not going to you know give up on my uh, uh, moral values my ethical values i'm going to do that because i belong to the kingdom of god and um, you know and so you lose out on your promotions you lose out on your perks you lose out on your uh, you know um, increments in your salary and all that is and the world will say hey you're being foolish right you you know you look at me i moved up the ladder and you're still where you are okay so the world can look at you and say that's that's foolishness but that is carrying your cross that is going through suffering and persecution and doesn't mean that god is not going to uh, bless you or god is not going to honor you or god is not going to reward you because the bible says that those who uh, you know got uh, blessing uh, honor uh, riches a uh, good name comes from the lord and when he opens you know um, the door no man can uh, shut okay and he's the lifter of our he's our glory and the lifter of our head okay but that takes a uh, quite a lot of you know decision and the choices and the right thinking that we have hey i'm doing this for the king's sake okay the world it look like foolishness okay uh, i know many of them who are doctors and they go and uh, live as uh, uh, missionaries i just met uh, uh, a person i uh, was interviewing somebody the two days back her her uh, her brother is um, a, a, a doctor in jharkhand with the tribals and she said she has a teenage son she sent him to live there he said whole, his whole thinking perspective changed when he came back he was not throwing an attitude he was not demanding things and she was very shocked because he's saying you know when he went he saw the tribals where they're living most of them are coming to the hospital because of uh, snake bites you know and the way um, his uncle that is this lady's brother is staying in being a doctor you know staying in a very small uh, house with very menial things and uh, this this child's perspective was totally changed so she's saying i'm planning to send him again you know so that he will learn you know so hey you're a doctor you studied and you're gone to jharkhand and you are this and you can go you know to uh, any country in the world you can earn so much money you can do things or even if you are a doctor and you know uh, you are not 
fleecing your patients by unnecessarily telling them to do this uh, test, that test, so that you can earn more money or not giving them the right medication so they keep running back and forth to you so that you earn more. All that is the standards of the world. But you are not doing that because you're doing that for, uh, you want to honor the king, for the king's sake. So you're, you know, you're willing to give up some things that you really enjoy, okay? Or, you know, you take on things that you know that is really hard for you to do or the king is telling you to do it and you do it anyway, okay? And for um, many of us, you know, giving up sometimes is very, very easy, okay? Some of the things we give up is very, very easy. But taking on is more difficult than giving up because taking on is harder because it is requires more work giving up sometimes is easier so sometimes you may say you know god you know i i'm willing to give this up thing up or you say i'm willing to do it for the king's sake or i'm doing it for the gospel's sake i'm doing it for jesus's sake and people around you are saying hey you're being very very foolish but you're saying i might look foolish but I'm doing it for the king's sake. I've heard many people who've been uh, CEOs in top companies, earning well, you know, given it, given it up just to go and minister to people. Not, uh, you know, just to be pastors or evangelists, but doing full-time ministry even in the market. Um, place okay or sometimes the king would say hey i want you to take on this responsibility and people are saying hey what are you doing you don't need to do it you don't have to go and become a pastor right so even when i was in 12th grade when i was praying and god called me into the full-time ministry you know uh, many people thought that i was being very very foolish you know i could do something more professional get into a professional job but um, even for me, you know, for me also to take on the call of God was something that I was not prepared. I was not ready because I thought I didn't fit that. You know, I was I didn't fit that as a person to be that holy person to go into full time ministry. But, you know, God knows. And uh, all I just said was, OK, God. So sometimes we might think, you know, it, it seems craziness to us. It seems foolishness to us. Uh, we don't fit in, uh, we, we think that we will not be able to do it, you know, but we are saying yes for the sake of the king, we're saying yes for the sake of the gospel, and we're saying yes for the kingdom's sake, okay? So even when it comes to family issues, you know, husband and wife, and, um, you know, as a wife, you're saying, hey, uh, you know, the Bible says I have to honor my husband, but my husband is being very difficult, very rude, but I just want to go by what the word of God says okay husbands you know uh, you're coming from a culture where it's it's uh, it's not uh, uh, for husbands to do the household chores uh, to love their wives to think of them as equal halves but you are doing that and you're saying hey, i'm doing it for the king's sake so even in those little things or for us you know whether to love our uh, mother-in-laws our father-in-laws who are being very difficult or our siblings or our our co-sisters and relatives who are being rude to us but you turn around and be nice to that to them that is something very very unusual because the world says hey you know don't keep doing it because then they're going to take advantage of you but you're saying hey i'm doing it for the king's sake i'm i'm willing to forgive i'm willing to love i'm willing to go the extra mile just to show them god's love i'm doing it for the king's sake so sometimes when um, we make decisions the world thinks that we are foolish um, you know we are being unreasonable but inside you you're saying hey i'm doing it with this perspective i'm doing it for the king's sake for the gospel's sake and jesus is saying this is kingdom thinking amen all of you with me, the kingdom thinking, or you are thinking something else? <laughs> kingdom thinking. Okay. So the next one is how to uh, think childlike. Okay. So Jesus taught us how to be uh, like little children. Many times Jesus challenged people to be like little children. So here in this instance, we see in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. Can somebody read that, please? The disciples come to Jesus and they're saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Okay. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greater in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, 
whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven so maybe jesus was knew what his disciples were thinking so the disciples were thinking hey one of us would be number one in the kingdom of god who is that number one who is the number two number three so jesus tells them who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven he called a little child places them and he says you know surely i say to you unless you be converted and become as little children you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven so what is jesus saying humble yourself like this little child okay so he saying forget about being the greatest you need to know how to be child like just to enter the kingdom of heaven so what jesus was saying is if you want to enter the kingdom of god or you want to experience the kingdom of god or you want to be great in the kingdom of god he says you have to be like a little child okay now we shouldn't confuse it uh, confuse being child like to being childish being child like is very different from being childish they are two different things okay so jesus didn't say be we should be childish he said we need to be child like what is being childish mean playful not serious what else being child like means hey that's mine that's me okay it's all about me it's not about anybody else okay that is being uh, childish okay uh, so what does it mean to be child like what is innocent and completely trusting the parents okay you've seen children when they come down the slide right the first time the father mother saying come down i am here i'm waiting for you okay and we've all gone through that experience and the the child is very scared but slowly the mother pushes and says you know scatching the child and then say see i caught you and so the child gets that assurance okay now a 3 month uh, uh, old child or a 4 month old child is not going to tell the mother mom you didn't mix enough salt in the food or mom did you you did not cook my food or mom you did not do my laundry doesn't say any of those things what does the child do just trust the parents okay so what is jesus saying he's saying you need to come to that place of total dependence of total trust where you're just abandoning yourself to the father you're abandoning yourself to the king because he knows everything you're just entrusting your life you're entrusting your present your future everything and you're saying god without you i am nothing without you i cannot do anything and that is being childlike total trust total dependence so in the kingdom of god being childlike is of great value okay look at what jesus says in matthew chapter 19 verse 14 matthew chapter 19 verse 14 jesus said let the children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of heaven so the kingdom of heaven is of people who are child like So Jesus is saying I want people who are childlike to be in my kingdom people who trust me who totally depend on me and look at what Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like in Mark chapter 10 verse 15 can somebody read that I certainly I say to you whoever does not receive the kingdom of god as a little child will by no means enter it Amen. So what is Jesus saying? Hey, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, if you want to experience the kingdom of God, you've got to receive it like a child. That means in childlike faith, in childlike trust, okay? Meaning there'll be a lot of things that God says and God is asking you to do which you cannot figure out, which you cannot understand, uh, which you cannot perceive, which you will it is not fitting in your logical reasoning and thinking but he says you just have to do what i am saying and that qualifies you to enter the kingdom that qualifies you to experience the kingdom of heaven okay so we need to make this part of our thinking there are times when god will speak to you times when he will challenge you times when he'll say hey i want you to behave like this i want you to do these things and you say god it just does not fit my thinking and those times we need to remember remind ourselves that the kingdom of heaven is made up of people who are child like simply trust and totally depending on the king okay amen 
So let's look at other aspects about kingdom thinking that God, uh, that Jesus taught. Another important thing about the kingdom of God is about being a servant in order to be great. So if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you got to be a servant. And if you're noticing it, all that we are saying is very different from the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light are total contrast. The kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God are total contrast. Okay. So look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 verses 20 to 28. Can somebody read that? Some online student can read. Can I read sister? Yeah, sure. Sister Gertrude. Yeah. Matthew 20, 20 to 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her son kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that they, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand on and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those who... for for whom it is prepared by my father. And when the ten heard, heard it, they were greatly displeased with their two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant and whoever desires to be first among you let him be your slave just as the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many amen so like all good mothers the mother of james and john had great dreams for her sons and she was trying to secure their future like all good mothers so she comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I have one and only one request. And after that, I'm not going to bother you. So what is her request? What is uh, that, her request? Yes. Grant that when you set up your kingdom, Jesus, she knows Jesus is going to set up the kingdom. She says, no, when, he set, when you set up the kingdom, let James sit on one of your uh, one hand and John on the other hand. Okay. So what does Jesus tell her? He asked them, can you drink the cup that I drink from? And what did they say? Yeah, we can. Yes, we can do it. Okay. They did not know it's a cup of suffering, right? It's, to, uh, you know, dying on the cross for the sins of mankind. They all ran away when actually when Jesus was, uh, was arrested. Okay. But they said, yes, yes, we can. And he said, what does he say? Yes, to sit on, okay, you can drink from the cup, you know, that I'm going to partake in, you can do that as well. But to sit on my right hand, on my left is not for me to decide. Okay, so Jesus is saying, okay, you know, uh, let me deal with this, the root of this issue. Okay, or the, let me deal with the root of the matter. So he, he's saying what you're looking for is greatness in the kingdom of God. Okay, you think that by sitting on my right hand and my left hand, you're going to be great in the kingdom of God. But he's saying it's not so. Okay, what does he say? He says, look in the world, the people of this world, what do they do? They exercise authority over others. Okay, so that is how the world is. But what does he say in his kingdom? If you want to be great in my kingdom, what, what does he say? You have to be the least. You have to be the servant. So he's saying, in my kingdom, if you want to be the leader, you got to be a servant. As simple as that. Okay. In my kingdom, if you want to be a leader, you have to 
So in my kingdom, if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. So this is the culture of the kingdom of God. And you and I belong to that culture. This is kingdom culture. This is kingdom thinking. So when it comes to kingdom thinking, we all need to think like this. That if you want to be great in God's kingdom, we must be willing to serve. We must be willing to be the least. We must be willing to uh, get down to do the menial little small things. Okay. So if you want to be a leader, you have to be a servant. And uh, when you are actually serving people, that is when you are leading people. Okay. When are you leading people? When you are serving, right? How wonderful all our churches and our families would be if we, we thought like this. We had this kingdom thinking, this kingdom culture. Okay. So the question is, are we willing to be a servant? Are we willing to become somebody who will have no attention, no significance, uh, whatever, so to speak? You know, we are not, uh, even if you're not applauded, even if you're not given uh, the due recognition, even if you're not praised for what we are doing, you know, even if you don't get that significance and attention, you know, are we willing to just serve? Do we have that kind of a heart? Do we have that kind of an attitude is what we need to see. Because many of them in the kingdom of God, you know, if they are not recognized, if they're not given the significance, if they're not given the title, if they are not praised, if they are not, um, you know, um, applauded for what they do, they say, hey, I'm just going to leave and go. This is not the place for me. I'm not recognized. I'm not appreciated. I'm not applauded right? And um, they say, let me leave and go. Let me see who does the work here. But you know what? That's not throwing the attitude at the people in the ministry or the pastor or those who are in charge. That's throwing an attitude at God. Yes, that's throwing an attitude at God. And remember, this is God's kingdom, right? He can even raise up stones to do the work of his kingdom. So even if you leave and you throw that attitude with God, no, God, nobody's appreciating me. Nobody's encouraging me. Nobody's applauding me. I don't have the title, don't have the fame, name. You know, I'm just like a donkey doing everything. <laughs> you know, uh, and people are using me like the donkey. You know, and um, you just leave. God is going to raise up someone else. There are other people that he will raise up and you will lose out in the kingdom of God. So in the kingdom of God, God is looking for people not who are sitting and lording it over and exercising authority. But in the kingdom of God, the greatest is those who are the least. The leader is the one who is serving. That is why we need to have a heart to serve. So when you are looking at ministering, please have this heart and this attitude that irrespective of any of the titles, appreciation, significance, whether you receive it or not, that you are serving the king of kings. Whatever you're doing, you're doing it for him. Okay. So you do your best. You work hard. You do what and God is the one he will reward you. So even if you don't get the reward, it doesn't matter. Right? That is not we are, what we are serving the king for. Now, that's not what we, what we are doing for the king's sake. We're not doing it to get rewards, but we're doing it to build his kingdom. Amen? We're doing it to extend his kingdom. We're doing it to represent the king of the kingdom that we belong to. And so when we represent him, we have to represent him in every area and every facet. And this is one of the important facets or areas that we have to represent the king of our kingdom in the right way. So, you know, what kind of heart do we have? Or what is the kind of attitude that we have? So whatever you do, whether you're some up, someone on stage or whether you're down there doing a little things, whatever you do, do it with the heart of a servant, that you are there to serve the king of kings and the lord of lords. So, you know, if you do it with the heart saying, hey, you know, I don't care, even if I'm not significant, even if I'm not, uh, you know, uh, getting that recognition, I'm actually preparing myself for the greatness in the kingdom of God. Okay. But if your heart is saying, hey, I want to do it to get a position. I want to do it because I want to be recognized. Then you are being disqualified for greatness and leadership in the kingdom of 
God. I'll repeat that again. If you're doing it out of a heart that is saying, hey, I want position, I want to be recognized, then you will be disqualified for greatness and leadership in the kingdom of God. So in the kingdom of God, things are totally looked at a different perspective, in a different way that we look at things, the way we think things, the way we live kingdom uh, life and the kingdom culture. So this is kingdom thinking. Okay. So are we willing to say, God, I'm willing to be the least so that I can be the greatest in the kingdom? Are you, are you willing to say, God, I want to be a servant so that I can be a true leader in the kingdom? Are you willing to say, God, whatever you call me to do or whatever I do or whatever my role is, whatever my function is, I'm doing it with a heart that says I will be your servant. I'm willing to become insignificant because that's the doorway for greatness and leadership in the kingdom of God. Amen. So kingdom thinking knows that when we humble ourselves to serve others, we are being like the king the one we represent. I think that line is there in the publication. So please look at that. It says, kingdom thinking knows that when we humble ourselves to serve others, we are being like the king, the one we represent. Amen? Okay. So we'll move on. Uh, celebrating the king's perspective. Okay. Now, Jesus spoke uh, or taught many parables about the kingdom of God. And here is one of those parables that he taught, uh, which is uh, written in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. So please read uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, please. For the kingdom of heaven is like a land landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into a vineyard, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whenever he is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh, However, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hides us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when the when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received the dinner denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they, they would receive more. And and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne to the burden and the head heat of the day but he answered one of them and said friend i'm doing you i'm i'm doing you no wrong did you not agree with me for a dinner yes take what is yours and go your way i wish to give to the least last man the same as to you is it not lawful for me to do what i wish with my own things or is your eye evil because i'm good so the last will be the first and the first last for many are called but few chosen amen okay so here in this par parable that jesus taught in matthew chapter 20 verse 1 to 16 i'm just paraphrasing it here you know this uh, man had uh, had a vineyard he wanted some people to work in the vineyard so he goes out in the marketplace it's nine o'clock in the morning he goes he finds some laborers and he asks them if they want to work and they're willing so he says i will give you one Denarius, okay, for working the whole day in my vineyard, and they agree. So they go and they start the work. And a little later, maybe at 10 o'clock, you know, he comes back to the uh, marketplace, he finds more laborers, and he's asking them if he's, they're looking for a job. And so they're saying yes. And so he's saying, Will you are you willing to work in my vineyard? And I'll pay you one denarius. They're willing. So he sends them off to his vineyard okay and then they start working in his vineyard and then it's 12 o'clock and he does the same thing okay 12 noon and then it's 
3 p.m., okay, uh, he goes again to the uh, marketplace, he finds more laborers, he sends them, he says, I'll give you a denarius. Then probably maybe 4 o'clock, he goes again to the marketplace, he finds more laborers, he sends them to his vineyard, okay. Then they're all working in the vineyard and say maybe it is 6 o'clock, it's time for them to all go home. And, uh, you know, he's um, uh, getting them uh, the daily wages to be paid for all of them. So all of them assemble. And then he starts from the last, the people who went and started working in his vineyard from 4 p.m. He pays them. And what does he pay? He tells his manager, pay them one denarius. Okay. So the people who came in at 3 o'clock, 3 p.m., they also get one denarius. People who came at 12 noon, they also get one denarius. People who came at 10 o'clock and 9 o'clock also get one denarius. So the people who came and worked from the beginning of the day at 9 o'clock, they were very, very upset. They were very disappointed. You know, so they raise up their hands and say, hey, we object to what you are doing. This is what you're doing is not fair. How can you pay people the same wages that you are paying us who work the whole day? These people just came at 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock. They just worked two hours. They worked three hours. How can you pay them the same for people who, for uh, you know, for us who work from nine o'clock in the morning? Okay. So what does the, the owner of the vineyard tell them? Come on, you can just tell me what the owner of the vineyard told them. What does he tell them? He asked them a very wise question. What did I agree to <laughs> give you, right? What did I agree to give you? I agreed to give you one denarius. Did I give you one denarius? Yes, one denarius is the daily wages. Have I been honest in paying you right? Yes. Then he says, then why do you question me now? Okay. And then he says, don't I have the right to choose what I want to do with the money that I have? Right? Don't I have the right to do what I wish? Okay, so what is the answer? Yes or no? Does the owner of the vineyard have the right to do whatever he wants with his money? Yes. And how much he wants to pay his, his laborers? Yes. So Jesus is saying, so also in the kingdom of God. Okay. Now in the kingdom of the world, this does not function this way, right? If you work from 9 o'clock, you work till 6 o'clock, you will get those the hours that you have worked okay if you come in at four o'clock you work till six o'clock you will get the hours the wages for only working two hours okay so that is the kingdom of the world but jesus is saying, saying uh, this is how it is in the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of god so what is he saying is he's saying god has the right to do what he pleases in his kingdom and when God has the right to do what he pleases in his kingdom, what he wills, what he plans, what he purposes, what should you and I do? We need to celebrate what God is doing. Amen? We need to celebrate what God is doing. Okay? Now, for example, just think that you have been a believer, say, for 10, 15 years. Okay? And you bring being praying about something for 10 years okay then after 10 years god answers your prayer and you're very excited that he answers your prayer here comes another person just say his name is joe so joe is just you know um, a believer over just say one or two years okay and he's asking god for something and god answers his prayer and you get very very angry you say god for joe you took only three or four months to answer his prayer. My prayer, you took 10 years, God. How many days I fasted and prayed? I fasted and prayed for 40 days. Sometimes I fasted and prayed for weeks together. And for Joe, only three months you answered. And for me, you took 10 years. So what is, Jesus, what is God going to tell you? Hey, did I answer your prayer? Yes. Do I have the right to answer when and what? At what time I want to answer? Yes. So that is God. He does what he pleases, what he plans. And so what should you do? Not get angry with Joe. Not be jealous of Joe. Okay. Not turn away from Joe. But you have to celebrate what God is doing in Joe's 
life. Amen. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll take a break and we'll come back. Thank you.